Namaskar viewers, hello and welcome to Sunset TV. I am Tina Jha, you're watching The Global Debate. The Chinese spy balloon that the US military shot down over the Atlantic Ocean last week was equipped with high-tech equipment capable of collecting communication signals and other sensitive information. As per the US State Department, the balloon had equipment that was clearly for intelligence surveillance, including multiple antennas that were capable of collecting and geolocating communications, and that it was likely part of a huge aerial spy program operated by the Chinese military that has targeted more than 40 countries on five continents, including India. China, of course, has dismissed the allegations, terming it an information warfare against Beijing by the US, also demanding that the US return the debris of the balloon. China has accused Washington of indiscriminate use of force over the balloon, which it says was only meant to carry out meteorological research. So now, as tensions escalate and the trust deficit between the two world powers widens, we discuss its global impact and implications on this edition of the Global Debate. To talk about the recent developments on the balloon saga and the spiraling US-China tensions, I'm joined on the program today by an illustrious panel. So let me begin by introducing the experts on the program. Uh, Dr. Liu Roger, Associate Professor, International Studies, Flame University, Pune, Maharashtra. Uh, Mr. Thomas Shattuck, he's Program Manager, Perry World House. And uh, Mr. Vivek Mishra, Senior Fellow, ORF. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining me on the program today on Sunset TV. Uh, Mr. Shattuck, let me uh, come to you with the first question. You know, uh, the, vice, uh, the, the U.S. president believes it's not a major security breach for America. He goes on to also say that the U.S.-China relations have not taken a hit despite the entire balloon saga taking place. Let's understand from you in, uh, to begin with, what's the general response to the entire balloon incident in the United States? Has it in any way accentuated the anti-China sentiment within the United States of America? I don't think that it has particularly damaged it beyond repair. I think it's just indicative of where things are. The cancellation of Secretary of State Blinken's visit to China is probably the most important fallout from all of this. The regular American just thinks it's kind of a joke that a balloon kind of ruined uh, a, a big high profile meeting. Um, and the fact that we were able to shoot it down and are now collecting uh, the parts and the balloon itself and the military has now said that they were able to stop it from collecting certain types of data, shows that we were on the case. Uh, we were able to make sure that the Chinese weren't able to get what they want. But I don't think that this is uh, damaging it in a way that other incidents in the past have. I think that this is just a minor blip uh, in the radar. Hopefully things will eventually uh, get back to normal. But I think at least from the US perspective, things need to change because this is a balloon that flew over multiple states across the United States, and now China is putting the blame on the United States and not accepting any responsibility for itself. And that is now the biggest issue uh, going on right now in the US. But is there no worry that the Chinese threat basically is nearer than ever before? The fact that uh, China may be just testing the capability of the United States to answer yeah, I think that it's been released now that um, four balloons under the uh, when President Trump was in office had been detected. They weren't necessarily sure what they were. And now we're calling it a high altitude awareness gap. Um, I think some of this is a bit overblown. It is, in fact, just a balloon flying over. We're now going to be much more aware of this and be on the lookout. But in terms of Chinese aggression towards the United States. I don't think that this goes to a high level um, in some respects as, say, the drills around Taiwan in response to Speaker Pelosi's visit in August. So I think if we take it in comparison to previous acts um, that the Chinese took, this is a very minor incident, in my opinion. Okay. Uh, Dr. Roger, what's your perspective? How do you look at the entire escalation that has happened? And also the fact that it comes at a time when the Secretary of State was supposed to actually go to Beijing to normalize ties, and it comes in at that time. Do you see this uh, recent episode actually deflating all possible efforts for some kind of thaw in US-China relations? Well, thank you for having me. Um, I think in the long term, the technology um, competition between the US and China has existed, but uh, I tend to believe that this is a glitch 
in intermilitary or diplomatic affairs between the two countries. Um, let's go back to history. Uh, in 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis, well, when it was on its height, on October 27th, uh, 1962, well, when the U.S. has begun uh, the dialogue with uh, Khrushchev, um, the general secretary of CPSU, well, the U.S. Air Force still launched its rocket test on this very important day, which the executive <clears throat> committee didn't know anything about. So I think this is, this might be a glitch that, um, well, this is a scheduled event that the Chinese intelligence agency or the military intelligence try to well, they, they may lose control of the uh, the, the, the balloon and uh, let it fly off the off the course. So I don't think they are related to um, uh, Secretary Blinken's uh, visit to the United States, and I don't think uh, to to China. And I, I I don't I don't think this is a coordinated event. I tend to believe it is a glitch. But however, um, like uh, President Biden has said in it, the State of the Union to the to the Congress. Uh, the long term, this is a this balloon incident actually has created a symbolic gesture in the American public, republic, uh, public especially that China has become a looming threat to the U.S. security. Not just for China. In fact, you know, if if the U.S. State Department official is to be believed, Mr. Bishra, it could have implications for over forty countries. So, as per reports, it says that it this this incident is part of a wider surveillance program that the Chinese are undertaking, targeting as many as forty countries across five continents, and which includes India. So, are there also security implications for India that we should be worried about, Mr. Mishra? Well, definitely. I mean, we are a contiguous state uh, of the China uh, of the Chinese uh, state. Uh, as well as the kind of relationship that we have had, especially for the past two and a half years, is definitely uh, indicative of the fact that we should be careful. Uh, but but I, uh, in, in the context of the U.S.-China relations itself, um, I think I would, I would extend the argument uh, from my two predecessors uh, uh, in the sense that I think it's a gray zone activity by China. Uh, you know, having a push, and this is an activity that certainly pushes the envelope uh, to, to the United States. Uh, in terms of uh, the fact that the gray zone activities are now uh, also capable of reaching uh, the mainland United States. So I think essentially the whole conception of the U.S. Uh, that is flanked by uh, sea on two sides and the, the homeland, the conception of homeland security traditionally that the United States has uh, is, is certainly being challenged by China. Uh, so I think in many contexts, uh, uh, it, it will not derail the relationship between China and the United States overall, uh, but it has certainly pushed the envelope to, to the United States. And I think in the context of India, certainly we should be more uh, cautious because, uh, you know, as, as the State Department has pointed out, there is a wider trail to this whole surveillance activity. So, you know, as, uh, uh, as it's indicative that this rivalry and this competition between the two global powers is only going to widen further, and uh, should, should the world accept that this is going to be the new normal in the times to come as well? Uh, well, I, I think so, because uh, it certainly goes into the domain of technology. And technology, as you see, has revolution, uh, revolutionized the, the whole globalization concept. It has blurred the lines between countries uh, uh, in a manner that has never happened before, uh, but in my sense, in a more hostile way. Uh, so in, in, in the sense that technology can now affect elections and 2024 is, is not that far, where India, the European Union, as well as the United States will go into election simultaneously. Uh, what can technology do? What can hostile nations do to affect uh, elections in democracy is a question that really haunts me. So I think definitely we've entered uh, a space which is not very comfortable uh, and we should all be cautious. Dr. Roger, you know, Mr. Mishra spoke about technology. What's intriguing about the entire incident and the balloon saga that we're discussing today is that in this age of modern warfare and where we are talking about also futuristic technologies like AI, why or what compelled China to uh, use uh, technology and use this uh, balloon surveillance, something that was uh, quite common in the 19th and the 20th centuries? How helpful is it uh, for China in terms of keeping an eye on adversaries? Well, China has, in the recent years, tried to focus more on how to 
defeat the enemy without actually using a force. So, well, um, so uh, technology like AI or other things becomes very important. And a lot of uh, experts has been um, speculating about the Chinese AI's development, especially if you if we still remember. Uh, 2025 is um, what made in China 2025 is going to meet its goal. So during the years where China has been focusing on uh, a major uh, t- um, aspect of technology and uh, especially AI and uh, um, uh, detective uh, technologies, they are trying to uh, dispatch uh, detectors in all around the world, including the uh, under uh, undersea uh, uh, surveillance um, uh, cables, and uh, including the balloon. Um, well, we, we see these days, and uh, and they are also still trying very hard to establish the um, the satellite systems. So I think in the future, China will be relying more and more on technology, especially they are developing and strengthening not only their fifth uh, generation fighters, but they are also trying to uh, make um, um make it coordinate with the uh, UAVs uh, for the future air warfare. So I think this is something that we should pay attention to. Uh, Mr. Shatter, coming back to you on, uh, you know, the argument that perhaps this may not, or this incident has not hit the US-China relations that hard and, and to a point of no return. This is an argument that, of course, the president has also made. But the question here is, looking at the kind of political response that it has generated within America, uh, the criticism that it has, uh, you know, actually uh, brought to the current uh, administration. Will it be difficult for Joe Biden to uh, normalize relations with China in the times to come? I think in the next uh, couple weeks to months, it will be difficult. I don't expect any high profile visits to occur because then Biden and his administration will be criticized not only by Republicans, but Democrats. The Democratic senator from Montana is very angry about this right now in the hearings that are going on. So I think we'll see a lull in relations, but both sides will eventually calm down and things will get back to normal. Outside of the balloon issue itself, what is most troubling for the U.S.-China relationship is that when Secretary Austin tried to contact his counterpart in Beijing, they decided not to accept the phone call. And that, more than anything, is a sign of things to come, where if you're in a crisis between the U.S. and China, whether it's over Taiwan, whether it's over a spy balloon, that we cannot now trust that our counterparts in Beijing will actually pick up the phone and talk things over with us and help reduce tensions. So we'll have to see how they react to that. Um, And also the fact that more and more countries are coming out saying, oh, yes, we've had these balloons. So this is not just a U.S.-China issue. This is a China issue for the rest of the world where they're now being found. I think one is actually over Taiwan right now as we speak. So this is not a U.S.-China issue. The U.S.-China specific issue is the fact that crisis management is at an all-time low. Dr. Roger, more indicative of the the fact that an assertive China is going to engage with the U.S. on its own terms. So precisely the fact that the defense secretary tried to reach out, there was no response from the Chinese. The Chinese are now instead blaming the U.S. of launching an information warfare. Dr. Roger. Is it for me or? Yes, yes, Dr. Roger. Um, Well, China has been launching information warfare in um, different countries, depending on what you're talking about. But uh, I think in the U.S., they are trying to use the balloons to collect some uh, uh, signal uh, intelligence. Uh, they use they usually use the satellites to collect uh, the image um, intelligence. But if you want to know what's actually happened within the, uh, uh, the Earth, you will have to use uh, balloons to collect that. So by doing that, um, China is trying, uh, especially the Chinese intelligence um, military intelligence is trying to construct the whole system of the U.S. Uh, military capability. But the information warfare used in other places will, will include more like uh, propaganda warfares, uh, including Taiwan and other places. And Thomas just talked about Taiwan. I would like to bring this up. Uh, Taiwan, for the year to come, is going to be a very unstable factor that will happen between China and the U.S., uh, because uh, Taiwan is going to have to hold its um, presidential election in January 2024. So this year will be uh, the very heated 
heated up year for all the parties to run for the president. And this is also the year that the U.S. and uh, China will try to influence the result of the Taiwanese presidential election. So we will see a lot of military diplomatic tactics being used all around Taiwan and in other places. So this will be the time that we will see most likely the tensions to rise up between U.S. and China. In fact, uh, you know, despite the ballooning deficit, Mr. Mishra, the trade numbers are stalking. I mean, I looked at the numbers and how it has risen in the last year. Uh, it, it touched record highs, both in terms of exports and imports in the year gone by. What does it uh, say about the relations, which the diplomatic relations are at an all-time low, but the trade relations are at an all-time high? Yeah, I think the numbers have touched on uh, an unprecedented high. Uh, because simply uh, of the fact that, you know, there is no doing in certain sectors uh, uh, with, with, uh, without the U.S. And, and China of each other. So, but apart from that, if you see Biden's, uh, Biden administration's policies compared to Trump administration when there was the stock of trade war, uh, I think it has mellowed down. And that has been internally one of the criticisms of, of Biden administration, not to say that Biden has been too lenient on, on China. Biden has come up with uh, some of the unprecedented steps against China, for instance, in the CHIPS Act. The CHIPS Act lays unprecedented uh, regulations on, on China, calling, uh, calling uh, all Americans back home. Uh, otherwise, the condition was that they, they could lose their U.S. citizenship. This hasn't been as, as, as stern as ever. Um, plus, uh, I think the Taiwan, uh, since Taiwan was being talked about, the Taiwan Policy Act, which is uh, of 2022, which you know, proposes a, a different kind of defense manufacturing collaboration with, with the Taiwanese, it all takes uh, U.S.-China relations to a, to, a, to a new low. So I think in the context of uh, the, the geopolitics, trade certainly is a big factor, which continues to be dependent on each other. But I think the overall uh, uh, signals of the relationship are really not very positive. Uh, Mr. Shatek, let me get back to you on, on the trade numbers, uh, a related question. Uh, despite the efforts that Mr. Mishra spoke about that the Biden administration has undertaken, particularly in the areas of semiconductors, uh, are there other areas where the trade engagement has gone up? Because why else will the numbers shoot up uh, to record highs? I think in, in, uh, in, in terms of, particularly in terms of uh, technology, but the U.S. has constrained itself. Uh, but there is, there continues to be a lot of dependence in pharma sector, for instance. Uh, also, other technologies, vehicles, uh, uh, services, laptops. Uh, you know, the, one of the largest uh, service uh, uh, shops of, of Apple, for instance, is in Shanghai, which was really uh, disrupted during COVID, and and that showed uh, how delicate the relationship between the two countries are. So, I think in terms of services, components, and also in chips, when uh, despite the regulations. Uh, to manufacture one chip, it, it exchanges more than 300 hands. Uh, and, and that shows the dependence of one country, not just between the United States and China, uh, but a whole lot of uh, other countries uh, that also share a hostile relationship with China. So I think despite the regulations, there has to be a, a bit of continuity in terms of uh, the uh, dependence of the by the sheer nature of the, uh, the, the service itself and the manufacturing itself. Uh, and I think that's why these, uh, these, these numbers are really up. And if you, you know, by contrast, if you also look at the U.S.-China relationship, uh, you know, at the height after the uh, the LSE dispute in the two years back, uh, you know, there were talks about severe sanctions, etc. But the numbers of trade, if you look right now, is very high. Okay, taking on that to you, uh, Dr. Roger. So, does this economic engagement, and it said about bilateral relations, that trade is the bedrock of relations between two countries. So, is this economic engagement, the interdependence on China, uh, that emboldens Beijing to carry out uh, its nefarious designs, both within uh, the, the South Asian region and also uh, across the continent, as we've seen? Well, I think we see a very interesting... Uh like uh, there is a contradiction between the direction of trade and national security. But first, I believe that this is like a shorter, short, short-term rebound of everything. And uh, most of the commodities being needed from Beijing are the wholesale, uh, the daily use one. But um, uh, I would like to echo what uh, Dr. Mishra has mentioned. I think for the future, we will see the upgrade of the securitization of trade and commodities, which means that we will see more and more commodities and 
items being listed as uh, national security related. Not only chips, but uh, all the electronic uh, devices or things that can be used for surveillance or the, even the cameras and all these electronic devices, we will see that, well, China will become its whole system while the U.S. and the Quad allies or the members of the uh, supply chain resilience initiative will be bounded all together in a stronger way to uh, consolidate and to protect its own supply chain. And we will, I think we'll, we will expect to see the more decoupling and delinking being happening between the Western world and China trying to reduce uh, the reliance on the Chinese on the especially strategic materials. Uh, Mr. Shata, decoupling is an interesting term here, looking at the kind of complex relationship we just spoke about. How difficult will it be uh, to actually undertake the procedure of decoupling? I don't think it's possible. I think it's too complicated, as both uh, Vivek and Roger have been saying, that things are just too interconnected right. at this point where it's difficult to remove China from any point in the supply chain, even if it is semiconductors where most of those are made in Taiwan. Um, the other parts of whatever we're buying, like a camera, they're made probably in China. So I don't think that decoupling is a realistic goal, but reducing certain key parts of the supply chain outside of China and into other places that we can more have a more reliable relationship with is probably where things are going to be headed. Like the United States struck this uh, as yet to be released deal with the Japanese and the Dutch about restricting China's ability to do any sort of chip manufacturing. So I think we'll see those sorts of efforts in key industries where we'll get our allies on board to choke the Chinese industry as best we can. But the world is so interconnected that outside of a large scale conflict, I don't think that private companies are willing to spend the amount of money that it would actually take to get their businesses out of China and somewhere else. So while all the talk of decoupling um, is very good politically for Democrats and Republicans, um, we'll see what happens in the next year. Like with, the, with all these new laws that were passed last year, the restrictions are now going to be in effect for 2023. So are we going to see waivers uh, for Chinese companies, which we believe are being um, granted to key Chinese tech companies? So if those waivers are given, trade is going to continue. Chinese companies are not going to be restricted in the way that the rhetoric is implying. So I don't think we'll see a mass decoupling thing, but I think we'll see very refined and pinpointed industrial um and technological decoupling because we want certain things to come back to the U.S. or we just want it to be in an allied homeland. But in the weeks to come, because the, you know, the United States administration has announced it is going to move ahead and take action against all of the Chinese entities who have in a way supported the balloon incursion. So do we expect new laws and trading of barbs at each other in the days to come also, which will further complicate the existing relationship? Yeah, I, every time we hit a new low, we find a new cave to go further down. I think that the things can always get worse. They can also get better. I think within the next month to six months, things are probably going to be a tit for tat about the balloon. And if someone goes, some high profile legislator, whether it's Speaker McCarthy or Representative McCall, if they go to Taiwan, that'll make things worse. So there's always prospect for making things worse. It's easy to make things worse. It's very difficult to make things better, especially when dialogue does not happen. If you're not going and having those in-person meetings, or if the other side isn't picking up the phone, there's not a chance to kind of bury the hatchet, move on from certain things. So yes, I think we'll find new and creative ways between now and June where things will get much worse. I think they'll be very pinpointed like the balloon issue. Uh, whether or not they're much larger scale over cert like a visit to Taiwan or new military agreements with the Philippines or Japan or Korea, that remains to be seen in the coming months. But yes, I, I anticipate things will get worse before they do get better. Okay, Mr. Mishra, I'll take one last word from you. And this relates to both U.S.-China and China-India relations. It, it's complex on both sides. The, the question here is it's increasingly getting difficult for countries to work with China because of the kind of uh, policies and, and the kind of nefarious designs that, the, that Beijing is currently engaged in. It complicates things for us and also at the same time poses security implications as we've discussed. 
Now we see the United States has apprised all the NATO members, all the Quad members about what has happened. What is the lesson for India amidst all, all, all of this that is taking place? Uh, I suppose the question is for me. Yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a fraught triangle. Uh, the complications are going to continue, uh, especially they're going to play out in the Indo-Pacific uh, uh, expanse. And I think in, in many ways, uh, the, uh, in the, on the trade bit that we were talking about, I just want to add a caveat here that, you know, there's a gradual weaning away from the concentration of supply chains in China, and that will take some time. Uh, so until then, you're going to see very high numbers vis-a-vis -vis China. Right. Uh, but places like India, places like Vietnam are going to open up in terms of manufacturing, and then there's, it's going to be a, a different scene. But that's going to take a long time. Until then, and that's why you see that the United States, the Quad, are working, uh, the, India together with the United States and, and, and the Quad, is working extremely hard to build alternative infrastructure, uh, alternative supply chains, and focusing on critical and emerging technologies. Only days back, uh, NSA Doval visited uh, uh, Washington and signed the ISTET, uh, which is uh, a, a specific agreement on in critical and emerging technologies. Now, all that is going to be very significant to how the Indo-Pacific, its trade and its security is going to be shaped. So I think it's very critical that India remains engaged in the Indo-Pacific along with the Quad. Right. So that having been said, I'll have to wind up the program. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining me on the program today and sharing your thoughts, your views with us and our viewers about the U.S.-China and also the U.S. Uh, the India-China relations, as uh, Mr. Mishra pointed out. It, it's going to be a difficult few months, but until that interdependence weans away from China, it, the, the, the numbers are going to be high, as we've seen in the year gone by. Uh, thank you once again to all three of you for sharing your thoughts with us and our viewers. And viewers, thank you very much to you as well for your time. I'll see you same time next week now. Take good care of yourselves. Keep watching Sunset TV.